Welcome to Therapist Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. Hi, everyone. I'm Ann Kelly, and Sue and I are preparing to launch our third season of Therapist Uncensored, and we really think it's going to be our best yet. And for the next couple of weeks as we prepare, we've decided to replay a few of our personal favorites or our most popular episodes that we want to make sure you didn't miss, especially on topics that we feel like are really relevant to our entire show. So today's episode is on self-compassion. I interview Dr. Kristen Neff, who's an internationally recognized expert and a teacher on self-compassion. So she is an associate professor of human development and culture at the University of Texas in Austin. And she teaches internationally on the topic, and she's even been featured on a TED Talk. I think you I know you're really going to enjoy it. Um, you know, we believe self-compassion is core to psychological health. And while it sounds, you know, like just be nice to yourself, it is actually much richer and at times a really difficult process to achieve. And Dr. Neff has a way of breaking it down and teaching it to us that it you know, really comes alive. Let's get started. In your recent TED Talk, you uh -huh. described yourself as a, I loved it, a self-compassion evangelist. Yes, I really am. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of my, it's my life's work and, and my goal to help as many people as possible learn about self-compassion and more recently to practice it. So although I still do basic research on self-compassion, I'm really focused on how do we teach this to people so they can be kinder to themselves. Because you've yeah. seen so much about how important it really is to the to the well being. Yes, a yes, and I've I've taught I've probably taught over a thousand workshops now on self compassion, and over and over and over again, I see lives transformed. So it really, it really works. It really makes a big difference. So I, I I have complete confidence in it, and so I suppose that's why I kind of joke that I'm an evangelist, and that um. I really see my role is to help people learn about it and, you know, at least try it out and see how it works for them. That's one reason why we were so excited to have you here, because mm -hmm. the concepts that you talk about, about why it's important, really fits into a lot of our beliefs at Therapist Uncensored. Yes. And um, But when you think about it so often, and you've mentioned this so often, when people think of the word or the concept of self-compassion, mm -hmm. they think of it as kind of a little woo-woo or, or kind of self-indulgent. And it's yeah. like, just be kind to yourself. And you think, oh, if you hear that, you should just change the way you think and be kind. There's actually deep science to it, and yeah. it's not that easy. Yeah, well, it's actually, I think it's, it's not that it's that difficult. It's that it goes against very deep-rooted habits and patterns that we have. Um, and I think as a culture, especially in American culture, we don't encourage self-compassion. We think there's a lot of virtues and self-criticism, and we have a lot of cultural blocks to self-compassion you know, beliefs that it'll undermine your motivation, it's self-indulgent, it's self-pity, it's narcissistic, it'll, it's letting yourself off the hook. There's a lot of really strong blocks to it. So once people decide they want to try being kind, kinder to themselves, it's actually not as hard as I thought it would be. I mean, people are different. It kind of depends on your history as well. It's a little more challenging for some people than others. But basically, the, the skill of self-compassion just requires treating yourself like you treat your good friends you care about. And most people have quite a bit of experience in terms of how to be supportive when a friend's struggling or they're feeling sad or they failed at something. We kind of know what to say. We know what tone of voice to use. Most of us have some experience being kind and supportive to others. So it's not really rocket science. It's just giving yourself permission to treat yourself the same way. Well, why do you think uh, the culture as it exists today, why do you think it seems to be so hard for us to be kind to ourselves? Yeah, it's a good question. But of course, you know, we should remember that it's not that long ago we used to have the same beliefs about our children. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that people thought spare the rod, spoil the child, that True. our children needed to be raised with harsh discipline, otherwise they would be self-indulgent and unmotivated. So luckily things have changed with child rearing and, you know, there's still a few people who take that approach, but most people realize the benefits of 
being encouraging and supportive and accepting of your child. At the same time, you try to help them reach their full potential. So we're just kind of behind the times in terms of how we relate to ourselves. You know, and I do think being in a very competitive culture puts strain on us. I think we assume that being hard on ourselves is going to drive us forward. It's going to give us our edge. Uh, When in fact, all the research shows it's just the opposite, that if you're really hard on yourself, you actually undermine your motivation. You become afraid of failure. You get anxiety. It's really not good at all for the ability to achieve your goals. But people do misunderstand that. They also misunderstand. They think When we say self-compassion, it just means being soft on yourself, right? Just, again, just doing whatever you want, taking it easy, where in fact, if you care about someone, then you want them to succeed. You don't want them to fail. You don't want them to suffer. So there's a lot of motivational power in that. Sometimes compassion can also be fierce. It can say, hey, harm's being done. You need to stop that. You need to knock that off and really draw in a a firm line uh, in the sand, Self-compassion can absolutely be fierce and protective, Um, but the whole idea is that it's emotionally warm and supportive as opposed to cold and harsh. And it's the cold, harsh part of self-criticism that's so damaging because uh, we know our brains, we know the way the brain, we should know this, the way our brains work. When we're filled with shame or we're filled with feelings of unworthiness, our brains are not in the optimal state to learn. No, um, so we're really pulling the rug out from underneath ourselves when we when we beat ourselves up. Yeah. We think we're motivating ourselves, don't we? We think when we're saying, "I'm going to do it. I'm going to get to the gym." And, God, I'm just such a such an idiot. idiot. Yeah. I'm such a wuss. Like I just like I said I was going to go to the gym and I don't, and I'm just yeah. I'm just so lazy. And and we yeah. think in that one moment, if we really kick ourselves, and a lot right. of people think that just get really hard. Would you talk a little bit more about the brain science of when we're actually being really hard on ourselves and what happens? Yeah, well, just one, one of the things we know, yeah, we release, we release cortisol, we go into fight or flight mode, we activate the sympathetic nervous system. And, you know, there is some benefit for it, right? So when we're in fight or, or flight mode, we're very alert. And if get it, that adrenaline, get that adrenaline. And if it didn't work at all, we wouldn't do it. Right. Right. So it does kind of get us in that alert state. OK, I'm going to I'm going to be attacked. I really need to get this done and maybe pay attention. But what happens is that when you're in a continual state of sympathetic arousal like that, you know, your brain just stops working properly. Right. It can't be as well integrated. You lose your ability to be flexible, to consider your options. You get locked in. You can have a very narrow focus, which ultimately isn't good for success. Um, Again, anxiety, we know performance anxiety uh, leads to fear of failure. We know for sure that when you're afraid of failure, you're going to be less able to try and take risks and learn from your failures. So in the long term, it it just is very counterproductive. But in the short term, it it kind of works just like with a child. I mean, in the short term... When you you finger wag them and you shame... Yeah, when you finger wag and you shame them into doing something, it does work. When it feels... In that immediate thing, when you're shaming your yeah. child, you think, oh, I'm going to implement change. And you That's feel right. helpless, so you shame. That's right. And then the child has that immediate compliance. So it That's feels right. seductive, isn't it? It's seductive because, I, and really what self criticism is doing is feeding the illusion of control. Right. Right. That, you know, I should have been able to do it right perfectly. And, and it feels better to think I, sh- I could have theoretically been perfect if I just tried a little harder than to meet the reality, which is, you know, sometimes we try and we just can't do it. And that's what it means to be human. And we just failure as part of the experience. And we aren't in total control. And that's scary. So we'd almost rather, you know, be mean to ourselves and feel in control than open to the reality that, you know, we try our best and sometimes we get it right and sometimes we don't. Um, but we know, like if you look at athletes, for instance, there's a lot of research now, a growing amount of research on self-compassion in athletics, that when players mess up in a game where they make a mistake, if they go into shame and they start dropping their head and they get discouraged, it's terrible for their game. You know, they need to be like a good teammate, support themselves. You know, I got your back. It's OK. I'm here for you. That type of encouragement and support is much more productive in the long run. 
So it's exactly the same thing with ourselves. Yeah. Well, I love the example of the team because you see the movies yeah. out there where they take yeah. them back and they shame them. And then all of a sudden you see this incredible performance. So we're really given this support uh-huh. and this message a lot to just kick yourself in the butt, yeah. give yourself a hard time. And, and yet, as you mentioned earlier, when we do that and we trigger all the cortisol in our body and yeah. it actually shuts us down and makes yeah, us does. more. So it makes us actually less team like because yes. now we're more self focus we're in a threat response and as we've talked about in other podcasts and you're mentioning here as we get in that threat response we're not able to be very relational think about the other person get connected which is so important to to team sports so it makes sense that that's really become a really important drive yeah and we also know that you know emotional flexibility so acceptance and commitment therapy makes a lot about talks a lot about this emotional flexibility, perspective taking ability to be able to really make good choices. We need to have a flexible perspective and shame and self-criticism does not give you a flexible perspective at all. It's just like this very simplistic black or white thinking. So, yeah. And you can get, it's like you mentioned earlier, you can get a habit. And once you have a habit, it is very well worn. It is. And as Dan Siegel says, you know, those things that fire together, you know, that that they really stay together. So, so learning to shift it, once you learn to shift Mm -hmm. it is really important. You, um, you mentioned earlier that with child rearing, we've kind of changed mm-hmm. and we've spared the rod and to, and we've grown and we've really adapted. But one of the things I love that you speak on is the, the emphasis in our culture for a while on self-esteem. Yes. And mm-hmm. how that's not necessarily been a good part of our culture, that self-concept is very important and feeling good about ourselves. Yes. But could you talk about the difference between self-esteem and self-compassion and how you see that self-esteem may have kind of affecting our culture in a different way? There's been a lot of research on this. There was actually a big backlash against self-esteem in the psychological literature. So to the extent that self-esteem is just defined as feelings of worthiness, there's nothing wrong with self-esteem. And, you know, to have low self-esteem and to feel unworthy, we know is very problematic for psychological health. But typically it's not just a feeling of worthiness. It's a judgment that we are good like a judgment of a positive judgment, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I'm a seven or above or whatever your criteria is. And so the, to the extent that self-esteem is a judgment or an evaluation of self-worth, in other words, it's not just automatic, it's contingent on being good at something or succeeding or something. That's when it becomes really problematic uh, for a lot of reasons. One is for most of us, To have high self-esteem, we have to feel special and above average. I mean, in our society, it is not okay to be average. It's it's like an insult. If you want to insult a freshman in your little psychology experiment, you can't tell them they're below average. But if you tell them they're average, they will react as if they've just gotten an F grade. Oh, it just feels like, and I'm thinking about my daughter, if she gets an average if she gets an average grade, she's just dropped. Like, yeah, I got average. So it's devastating. Mm-hmm. So you have this psychological pressure in the entire society for everyone to be above average, which is impossible, right? That's absolutely So what happens is people start distorting things. They start, you know, inflating their own performance. They start subtly trying to put other people down. And it really sets up this process of social comparison. So my worth is partially dependent on how I compare to other people's performance. And that leads to really nasty things. Like um, they know for sure that bullying is largely caused by the quest for high self-esteem. Kids coming into adolescence, you know, sixth or seventh grade, they don't have a lot to base their self-worth on. So how do they get it? By picking on that weak kid, the nerdy kid, and they get a self-esteem boost in comparison. That's part of why they do it. And, you know, a lot of problems in society are due to having to feel superior to others. Um, You know, prejudice, narcissism, right? Um, Right. Actually, there's researchers, um, Gene Twenge and Keith Campbell, have been studying the narcissism levels of college undergraduates for the past 25 years, and they find they're at the highest level ever recorded. And they argue that's because of the emphasis on self-esteem by very well-meaning teachers and parents. But this constant message, you know, you're special, you're wonderful, leads people to feel that they have to always be special and they have to always be wonderful and they have to always be number one. And that, again, you know, leads to some pretty nasty behavior. I won't go into narcissism, but there's some good examples of 
the, the problems of narcissism in our society. Very present right very, now. Very present in, 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 our, um, in our cultural psyche. Well, and yeah, as you so. said that, I mean, like what I hear you saying is also that if our self-worth, which is vital to our existence, we yes. have to feel important. That's part of our human need. Yes, we, our, need, to, we need to be worthy, we need valuable. To be worthy. Yeah. And if our need to be worthy is now contingent on something that becomes comparison, That's then right. my worth is always based on a comparison. It sets up a model instead of it being about relationality and mm-hmm. connection. It's about I need to be better than yes. or I'm less than. And That's I th- right. think of the pressures in social media, yeah, on, totally. on the current culture. Completely. Like, so maybe you, maybe you going to the prom and you look amazing and you love your dress and you're feeling good about yourself. And then that other girl walks in who's taller right. and thinner and her dress is that much nicer. And then you feel bad. So once it's com- comparative like that, you can really never win because there's always somebody doing it better. Always you know? somebody doing and better. And it's not just social comparison. It's also comparison to internal standards. I mean, you might think, oh, I don't care about other people, but I have my own standards of success. Um, the problem with that is that our self-esteem becomes contingent on success, right? So, yeah, you feel good about yourself when you get the A in the math exam or you, you know, win that basketball game or you make new friends and are accepted and popular. But what happens when you hit hard times, when you fail, when you make a mistake, then your self-esteem basically goes out the window because your sense of worthiness is contingent on success. And we know for for a fact that the sense of self-worth linked to self-esteem is much less stable than the sense of self-worth linked to self-compassion, right? It goes up and down based on your latest success or failure. But self-compassion, which is really being worthy because you're a flawed human being like everyone else, I mean, you can always achieve that, right? In times of success or times of failure, you are still a valuable, worthy human being just because you're human. So we know the sense of self-worth linked to self-compassion is much less contingent, much more unconditional. And we know it's much more stable over time for that reason. So, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with self-esteem. It's how do you get it? And most people get it from pretty unhealthy sources. Self-compassion is actually a source of self-esteem. Sure. But that, it's that makes unconditional. A lot. Because bait, you're you know? talking about something that helps you feel good. And, feel and worthy. Yeah. And helps you feel worthy. Right. And I think that's one reason why I really want to help our listeners understand the difference. Because mm-hmm. to go back to narcissism for a minute, because mm-hmm. I can guarantee you some of our listeners hearing that narcissism is steadily going up and lots of our listeners ha- have have kids or yeah. are those age groups mm-hmm. themselves and that was serve as an alarm bell and and there is a lot of discussion about narcissism and prejudice mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you're you're yeah. you're linking the the focus on self-esteem to both prejudice yeah. in that one mm-hmm. race may need to feel better than mm-hmm. another and so that you you see a lot of linking of social comparison right now yeah, yeah. and what we're talking about is how distancing that is mm-hmm. and To just tap on narcissism, if we could, for a minute, one of the very aspects of what creates narcissism Mm -hmm. um, or an aspect of narcissism is this feeling of I need to be all good. And if I'm not all good, I'm all bad. Yes. Yes. And so Uh the, the focus being is I need to keep being that great self because if I'm not, then I'm my bad self. And so that sort of sets up this whole dynamic. And you've spoken Mm -hmm. about this before. Mm -hmm of it's very hard then to take in the your own deficits like That's you can't right. actually tolerate your own deficits you can't That's see right. your own needs you can't right. you can't apologize we may have seen a few examples of that in the yeah. in the last year related yeah. uh, that you can't apologize because to apologize you have to or to reach you have to recognize a deficit or yeah. to be grateful you have to recognize that you have some level of need and so that's really almost impossible. And yeah. so I love how you integrate how self-compassion is so mm-hmm. essential because in that way you have to be aware of your own humanness and your own deficits. Yeah. It's Could a, you talk about yeah, that? Well, see, so yeah, by definition, really, so the word compassion, so come means with, passion means suffer. So compassion by definition it refers to how we relate to our own suffering, you might say, Mm -hmm. our own imperfection, when we make mistakes, when we fail, when we struggle. Um, That's really when self-compassion comes online. 
Um, so we kind of have to make it an intentional practice to learn how to relate to our own emotional pain, our mistakes, our failures, our struggles right. in order to uh, learn how to deal with it productively as opposed to being derailed by it. I think the very beautiful thing about self-compassion is when we learn to hold our struggles and our imperfection with kindness, a sense of connectedness, mindfulness. Those are actually the three components of self-compassion, kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. Another term for those three components that is kind of more evocative is loving, connected presence. So when we are in a state of self-compassion, we are in a state of loving, connected presence. And when we evoke that state, Every time there's pain or failure or mistakes or struggle, then we aren't defined anymore by those negative emotions. But we're actually, you might say, um, our awareness is, is filled with this loving, connected presence, all of which are very positive emotions. They're relational, they're heart-centered, they're calm, they're balanced. That's the mindfulness. So um, that's why it's turning out that self-compassion is probably one of the most powerful coping mechanisms we have because it can hold anything Mm, that makes right? sense. You right. know, so you're you're generating this very positive, resilient, flexible mindset. You aren't pushing away the suffering. You aren't ignoring it. You aren't trying to get rid of it. You're just saying, "Wow, this is really hard right now. I'm I'm feeling really bad." And you're kind to yourself in the midst of it. And then you're you know it really offsets the the negative parts of of the negative experience and generates positive ones. So it's it's really, it still always amazes me, the power of self-compassion. I can precisely, see why. Precisely because it's defined as what happens when things get difficult, which is usually where the problems come, right? When things right. are all happy and, no, you know, we don't have a problem. How do we deal with adversity? We have mm-hmm. a choice, you know. We try to not have adverse experiences. Good luck with that one, you know. Or we learn to use it as an opportunity to open our hearts. And when our hearts are open, that's when we're happy. You know, oh, I love how you sedate that. That's so I think yeah. it's so inspiring because what 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 I hear you saying and all that is that this isn't easy because I mean, I think of self-compassion is really difficult, especially when we've done something that feels shameful. Sure. Yeah. So it's one thing when I find it easier to have self-compassion when things are hard and they're yes. just hard out there in the world and go, oh, yes. this is just hard. Yeah. I think it's harder when I have found myself like doing something yeah. that I feel embarrassed about or shameful yeah. of. Yeah. And then yeah, I tend absolutely. to be, you know, I can be like, let's say if I get really angry, I've got mm-hmm. teenagers, so mm-hmm. this may shock you, but every once in a while yeah, I get, you lose it. I lose it. <laughs> yeah. I, I lose yeah. it when I get that eye roll or that uh-huh. look. And I, as a psychologist, mm-hmm. I should tell myself, oh, I should know how to do this. And I should mm-hmm. be able to be this calm. I know this is adolescence, but it's not always easy. So sometimes yeah. when I lose it, I walk away and I feel mm-hmm. so much, mm-hmm. you know, like, ah, oh, like shame about it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that's where it's the hardest to to stop and not yeah. just beat myself up. And It is the hardest, but it's also the most productive time to be self-compassionate. In many ways, self-compassion is an antidote to shame because what it means when we can hold our shameful behavior and self-compassion is that instead of, you know, promulgating with the negative core beliefs, I'm terrible, I'm a horrible mother, you're actually kind and understanding. Instead of feeling isolated, like, oh, it's just me. And that's what shame is really um, linked biologically kind of to that feeling of isolation, of wanting to hide. It's maintained by silence. But remembering that you know, actually, this is part of motherhood. All mothers do it. It's, you know, we don't want to, but this is human. Then you don't have to hide it. You don't have to hide it in a secret. You can actually look at it and confront it, and that's going to help you actually apologize and deal with it. Um, and also, you know, mindfulness, which is, I love it. I've done a bit of work with Brene Brown. She doesn't like the word mindfulness. And she said, 
can we rename it Courageous Presence? And I'm like, yes, that's such a good idea. <laughs> I you like know? that. Yeah. So we can have the courage to be present with what's difficult, like the shame of yelling at your kids, as opposed to the other, the opposite of mindfulness in this model is over identification, which is like when we, instead of I did something bad, it's like I am bad and we get stuck in our thoughts and we ruminate on it. I we suck as also, a parent. I right. have no patience. And it drives shame. And then when you're, so when you are judging yourself, and you're feeling isolated and you're identified with what happened, you are not in the place to apologize. You are not That's in the true. place to repair your situation at all. No, I'm actually probably a little bit more in a place of trying to justify why I lost yes, it. Blaming so, the kids. So I'm going to yeah, come up and right. said, hey, I'm sorry I got mad, but I got mad because yeah, you, because you, that's you, right. you, you, and it's that's again, right. then I'm yeah. just furthering the disconnect from, from them instead of. Exactly. So maybe in this example, and I love the concept, just take courageousness it courage. to yeah. be aware that. I'm stay feeling present. Yeah, yeah. That I'm feeling shame. Yes, you have to be mindful of shame, which is the last thing in the world you, you, oh, yes. you want to do. But, you know, again, there's a lot of research that shows people with more self-compassion are more likely to take personal responsibility for their transgressions and more likely to try to repair them. Because you need that compassionate frame of mind toward yourself to be willing to take action to repair so you don't just hide in shame or isolate or, again, just, right. you sense. know, try to blame the other person. Let's pause to thank our sponsor, Leslie University Mental Health Counseling Programs, where you can help others transform their lives with creativity and compassion. You can apply a social justice lens to mental health care and achieve your own goals through their master's and PhD programs. Online at leslie.edu slash mental dash health. Now let's return to our podcast. So, so, so if you were going to help me, let's say I am in this habit, if I, which mm-hmm. I uh, not necessarily I don't want to portray them in a habit of always yelling at my kids. But I think in talking with people, that's probably some of the most painful. So if we use that as an example, yeah. so I've just really inappropriately was too aggressive and yes. yelled at my child and I walk away. And then yes. I can really relate to what you're saying, just feeling shame and then feeling isolated, like, yeah. and like not wanting to admit to myself or anybody that sort of yelled at my child. Yeah. And as you describe mm-hmm. it, now I can really feel what you mean about being disconnected. And now I feel a little alone. Yes. And I, I and I could feel that separateness, which of course, as we've talked about, that makes us feel threatened to be disconnected yes. and alone is a That's natural right. part of our body to feel threatened. So yeah. what would you suggest if you were going to walk me through that? Yeah. How would I, how would I shift from that place in your model of those three, yeah. uh, of the mm-hmm. three areas, how would you help me? Well, so um, usually in terms of temporal sequence, mindfulness comes first because mindfulness is just being aware of what's happening. In a way, we can't do anything if we aren't aware of what's happening, if we're suppressing or we're lost in the storyline of, oh gosh, I'm so horrible. So just being aware of the pain of what's happened. So I'm going to be willing to be with the pain of the fact that I just yelled at my kids. Uh You're not going to want to be present with it. So you do have to be courage and you have to hold it in your awareness, right? Okay, this is what's coming up for me. And then I I yelled at my kid, but they deserved it. (laughs) That's why I have to get out of that place. Because, yeah, yeah. they didn't deserve to be yelled at. There's nothing they did. But nonetheless, you you are unhappy with your reaction. You knew instinctually that that's not the way you wanted to react. And it may be harming your relationship. So you got to be able to be with the pain of that. And it's scary. But you don't want to just be with the pain of it. I mean, you you can be. But that's why these other elements are so important. So, um, So the other two elements elements versus the kindness. Very, it's a lot easier to access kindness if we think, well, how would you relate to a friend who'd done the same thing? So if you mm. think about how would you talk to a friend who said, you know, I can't believe it. I got so mad and I yelled at my kids and I feel terrible. You would probably immediately say, oh, yes. oh I totally get you. It's so hard being a parent of teenagers and I've you know, done we're it just too. tired and, and you're stressed. And yeah, it's not ideal and it's not what you want, but it's so natural and you understand you much more understanding of all the reasons that went into the behavior. And you know that by being supportive to your friend, they're actually going to be more likely to deal with that situation when you, than if you were to judge them harshly. Um, but then common humanity is so key. Really, I mean, like it or not, we are imperfect human beings. 
You know, I've, mm-hmm. I've done a lot of work, a lot of practice. I've done a lot of self-compassion work and I still lose it sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like, you know, uh, uh, I've got a great quote on this. One of my favorite meditation teachers, Rob Nairn says, you know, the goal of practice is just to become a compassionate mess. Oh, I love that. You will never not be a mess. I mean, you may be a little less messy, but you know, you are a human being, which means you will make mistakes and you will get it wrong. By definition, you know, unless you become an enlightened being, and maybe a few of us will, but probably most of us won't in this lifetime, we are going to be a mess, but we can be a compassionate mess. So what happens when we're a compassionate mess? We're fully human, but with compassion is that means that since we don't give up our expectations of being superhuman, we can work with it. Right. Right. So if I lose it, like, let's say, get overly mad at a student or or someone, but I'm compassionate, then I can move forward. I'm not stuck. I can say, I'm sorry. Can we talk about it? What should we do about it? You know, how can I repair the situation? You keep the doors open so you aren't stuck in the failure or the mistake. But with shame and just beating yourself up, I mean, you know, yeah, maybe beating yourself up will help you Well, I'll apologize. It's not like it doesn't work at all. But again, you aren't going to be in the optimal mind state to do your best or know to, or to know the wisest thing to do. And more often than not, you just tend to hide your head in shame and you don't even own up to the person what you've done because it's just too painful. Oh, that makes sense. And I guess if you're caught in in beating yourself up, it gives yeah. you the illusion that you're doing something. Yeah. Like because you're 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 kind of chastising yourself. That's right. And so it gives you an illusion of something, but it's all about myself. And it's yeah, not about it's what I hear. Self-focused. It's very it's self-focused. It's very self-focused. It's not, yeah. it doesn't do repair. So then I'm just, oh, now I'm bad. Yeah. That's and right. I'm very self-focused. Mm-hmm. And so I love what you're saying because it really helps me. So what I would be doing is going, oh my God, like, okay. It, the, what you're saying with a common humanist is that if I'm kind to myself and I thought, okay, parenting is hard. Yeah. People yell. And I get one fear is I've just ruined the relationship with my child. So I guess yeah. I go through fears like people yeah. yell. Our relationship yeah. is fine. It's this is hard yeah. being a parent. It is. But the more you're able to turn toward it and talk about it with your child, including saying, I'm so sorry. And then you can even talk about, you know, the pressures and what happened for you. And so your child will start to understand what went on for you. You'll probably end up strengthening the relationship rather than harming it. If you can really openly and honestly talk about what happened. And again, it doesn't mean you justify the bad behavior. It doesn't mean, oh, it, you know, it's only human, like it kind of blowing it off. Right. You have to be, re- you're saying you, you need to be, to be really real. connected. You have to be mindful, fully open to the reality. Courageously. You have to be courageously present with holding, wow, I feel so bad. I am so sorry. And you have to really be able to hold that. But if you are able to hold that right. and be honest and authentic with the person who you've harmed, usually, again, that's, you know, it depends on the other person what, where they're at. But more often than not, it actually can help make the relationship more real and honest and, you know, move forward from there. So, you know, and also in some ways we have no choice. It's not like we have the option of being perfect. That's so true. You know, if, if we're actually aware of ourselves, yeah, I, mean, I guess we have like, the option yeah. of denial. We have the option of denial, <laughs> but we actually don't have our self critic would like us to think we have the option of being perfect. It really would. And I would almost say, if that was an option, go for it. The problem is, it's not. It's not oh, reality. It's not. You know, it's just not reality. So we have to work with what we can. But in terms of what we have, I mean, it can be so beautiful opening to imperfection. Oh, that's so you true. Know, there's so much there's so much richness here and we usually learn the most from our failures and our mistakes and um and, and relationships often get strongest when they when you go through a hard time with openness and open heartedness. You know, so Well and the relation like you like what you're saying, the relationship so deeply improves. If I think about the relationship yeah. with my daughter, yeah. if I really slow it down to feel myself yeah. instead of rush and like what you're saying is if I've taken the time to step yeah. away yeah. And, and get connected to myself and my own humanness and my yes. and then I go back, yes. then I can really repair the relationship and actually could end up even stronger yeah. and mm-hmm. feeling more and and of course helping our child be more resilient because yeah. the world yeah. isn't perfect and if I'm perfect 
perfect. <laughs> it's going to be pretty tough out there when they get up. Yeah, and also in terms of modeling, right? Right. So if we are very self-critical in front of our children, even if we don't criticize them, even if we have it together enough not to be harshly, you know, to, to use the rod with our children, if we self-criticize a lot in front of our children, they're going to get the message that this is the best way to be. So if we can model self-compassion and model, wow, you know, I feel really badly, you know, it, it is human, it happens. Um, you know, what can I do to help to repair mm-hmm. the situation? That's actually what we want to be modeling. We don't want to be modeling, I'm so stupid, I was so mean, you know, I'm, I'm so worthless. That's not going to help anyone. No, and I guess we need to be modeling that. And as you mentioned, helping our kids step out of That's this right. concept of good, bad. Yes. And, and, and help them learn to have their own self-compassion. Do yes. you have any suggestions what you would say to help kids learn self-compassion, what a parent would do to help them? Yeah, well, like I said, I, I really do think modeling is the most powerful way that when a situation comes up, which it will, a failure or making a mistake or some struggle, really modeling mindfulness, being able to be aware of it, kindness, kind language toward oneself, being understanding, and again, common humanity, just this principle that this is part of what it means to be human. It's not something to be feared. It's not something to be judged. You know, we're all just kind of human beings doing the best we can, and can we make the most of it instead of trying to hide from that reality? And I think when kids see that model, that's when they learn it the most deeply. Oh, that makes, I I absolutely agree with you. It it helps bring out their desire to do it to other people and with themselves. And I think also to get them into away from that their whole self-concept is based on a comparison model. That's right. But to be able to help them connect to say, you know what, you made an average grade. And yeah. you really worked hard and that's, yeah. you know, and, and it isn't, it's, it's a way of connecting and who they are and what they, that must be really hard for you that yeah. I know you want to do your best. And if they didn't try their hardest and doesn't mm-hmm. mean you don't still encourage and support them to do Definitely. better, you know, and then you can actually say, well, well, you know, what went on? Did, did you try that hard? And maybe they really did. And maybe that's just okay. Maybe I'm just a B math student, but maybe they didn't, you know, and then you can help them do better. The whole difference is instead of wanting your child to do better because they're inadequate as they are, you want your child to do better because you love them and you want them to be happy. And the child really feels the difference. We feel the difference with ourselves. You know, do we have to improve because we're not good enough? Or are we fully acceptable as we are with the idea that, you know, and yes, but we want to be happy. So we'll try our best to be happy and reach our goals. And we, but like the bottom line is if we don't, that's okay too. And that's- that takes the pressure off, you know. So what would you say to somebody who is listening mm-hmm. and is really recognizing how much they do that negative Mm self-talk and you've talked about how just in your body how hard that is yeah and and we you know we touched on the part that comes out when you're doing self-compassion and Mm -hmm. you've done such a great job about talking about also what physiologically happens when we bring out and so we're a bunch of neuro nerds on this podcast okay um but Mm -hmm. you know what what actually happens also chemically when you you happen the the research the scientific research that you've Mm -hmm. done around when self-compassion happens, what happens physiologically in our body? Yeah, so we don't actually have as much uh, physiological research as I I would like. We have a little bit. We know, for instance, that cortisol reduces. We suspect that oxytocin and opiates increase, but actually, to be honest, most of the research has been done on what happens when you give compassion to other people. So oh, that, really? that's still a hole in the research that needs to be filled. So when um, you, when you, what you're saying is when the research does show that when you're showing compassion for other people, yes. that then you get the oxytocin, oxytocin and, and, opiates, and the, the opiates. The mammalian caregiver response, yeah. And I'm assuming that the same thing happens to self-compassion, but that actually is a, something, you know... Someone needs to do that research. I, I keep on asking all my friends, you do that type of research to do it. It hasn't happened yet. It will. What we do know is that immune function increases 
and heart rate variability increases, mm. right? Which are both signs of kind of, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system. So heart rate variability is when your heart rate is able to respond more flexibly to the situation as opposed to be rigidly locked into a certain pattern. So we, we have several studies now showing that self-compassion increases heart rate variability and several studies showing like if you put people in a very stressful situation and you measure their immune function response, mm-hmm. the self-compassion compassion helps enhance immune function. So we're getting kind of a general picture that it helps the body to respond in a healthier manner, although there still is a lot of research that needs to be done. I'm excited yeah. that you're doing yeah. it and you have such a focus yeah, on I'm it. Yeah, I'm not doing it myself. I'm actually, I don't do that type of research. So I, all my clever friends, I, I do no, that but type you're of research. The, but you, but you, yeah. you send out the message so yeah. widely about how important it is. Yeah. And that's yeah. what is so exciting and how important yeah. it is. And just the fact that if the body itself fe- mm-hmm. experiences compassion, yes. that it really activates that part of our body. Yes. That like you're saying, that, yeah, that the really... The sympathetic, it just yeah, allows yes. it to relax and to function more more effectively. And there's some, there's some research like showing that people are more self-compassionate habitually, like less, have less physiological symptoms, right? They get fewer headaches, stomach complaints, just things like that. And that's kind of based on self-report, but we're starting to get a sense that it, it is good physiologically for you. I mean, it makes sense it's just because if you look at the opposite of self-compassion, harsh self-criticism, there's a ton of research showing how bad that is for your body to be in that constant state of fight or flight towards yourself. Would yeah. you have any recommendations? And I, I know mm-hmm. I'm putting you on the on the spot here a little mm-hmm. bit, but you've alluded to the fact right now um, in our culture. Mm-hmm. We have, I guess we could all know that we have a high threat happening everywhere right now yeah, with relationships, yeah. with uh, yeah. prejudice, with some racial tensions, yes. with some experience of feeling dominated. Yeah. And so that it, it, right now I can see that there's a, a lot of difficulty people are having to have compassion for others and yeah. even having self-compassion about how stirred up they are. Yeah. And I'm wondering, yeah. as, as mm-hmm. our resident expert in self-compassion uh-huh. and compassion, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, it definitely the world is calling for us to pay attention to compassion, right? And so just because other people aren't showing compassion doesn't mean we have to give up and, and fight and lose our, our commitment to peace and compassion. If anything, it, we have to redouble our efforts not to carve anyone out of the human race. I mean, I know it's hard. There's certain people I would like to say they are not human. I understand. But of course, they are human. You know, and if we really f- go down that route and if we start being like the people that we're unhappy with, which is judgmental and some people are better than others and, you know, some people are first, other people are second, then we're just going to be, you know, kind of reinventing the problem, so to speak. So I think, you know, if you look at all the great leaders in history, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, they were all, they all took compassion action. They led social reform with compassion at the forefront. And I think, I think that's what we need to do. And actually, I'm kind of encouraged. I mean, so there's a lot of difficult things happening, but there's also a lot of wonderful things happening in terms of, you know, if you don't mind me being political, this, this current true. thing about, you know, the refugees, that you're getting so many people talking about, wait a second, our nation is all about accepting refugees. And it's about, you know, it's kind of forcing people to commit to their values. And the way we bring about that commitment to values has to be in line with the values. Right. So oh, yeah. that means we have to be able to accept that different people have points of view and yet have our, so our compassion needs to be fierce. We need to draw the line in the sand and say, that's not okay, but we can't cut anyone out of our hearts, right? So, Because if we do that, then we get really politicized and and have warring factions, that's not going to help either. So it's really taking, it's going to take a lot of courage as a society to stick to our values of compassion, and yet we're being shown what happens if we don't, the horror that happens if we don't stick to our values of inclusiveness and love and compassion and you know, kind of unity and peace, you know. So it's, it's almost this part of me that feels like this needs to happen because we can't take it for granted. You know, we have to be consciously aware that these are values that we need to always be working toward and we can't just, you know, forget about them and assume they're going to be followed because they won't be. Oh, that's know? so true. It would be, and I think that is not that any of us would want 
to have what's happening in our, our country happening, but, yeah. but it is, it has awoken. It's, There's w- an aw- it's, w- yeah, it's waking us up. It's, it's waking, waking us up, up to, mm-hmm. to, to not just being self-focused and yeah. what's, what's in my own esteem, what yeah. makes me feel good. Yeah. Um, and if we get lost in that, we can get lost in our culture. And I, I love yeah. what you're saying. Cause there's this, the, we can have the thought of self-compassion means we're supposed to just get over it and be okay. And, um, mm-hmm. it, it, if we take it as just, we're just supposed to be kind to everybody. Yeah. And that isn't what you're saying. You're saying it's, it's fiercely it getting in touch. Fierce. Yeah. So we do, I think, well, I know I've had to practice a lot of self-compassion. So we do need <laughs> self-compassion yes. because there's pain. I mean, there's just pain and, and fear. Seeing there's pain and there's fear, and, and just seeing your society turn upside down, that's hard. So we need to be. But you know, remember, self compassion is not just like softness and kindness, tenderness. That's part of it, but it's also supporting and protecting. And so sometimes the, the metaphor that may be useful it's like we got to be our own allies, our own wingman. We got to have our own backs, and it can be like an active supporting, protecting role. If you have your own back, that means you also protect yourself against anyone who's going to try to harm you or other people. And that's definitely a part of being a good friend. So it's it's really both. And so maybe in in some moments, the tender softness is more appropriate. In other, in other moments, that fierce, protective type of compassion is more important. So you don't have to say, I should just get over it. You can say, no, like no, people are you telling you, you should just, it. instead, you could be fiercely aware that you feel threat, fiercely aware that this yeah, is this difficult. this is not okay. And this I, is, you know, this is this not is okay. This is hard. It's hard and it's not okay. And I'm going to do something about it. The difference is, is you don't get locked in the, in the shoulds. This shouldn't be happening. We get locked into shoulds and right and wrong, and this person's right and this person's wrong. Then you lose the human element, you know? You get back into the judgment the and, judgment. It's, and the yeah, distancing rather than... Right. This is what we're seeing now. This is, this is part of our very long history of humanity. This is part of what it means to be human, too. That makes sense. It's not just something new. The things yeah. that we're having, they're boiling it, but this is part of our existence. That's right. And then as human beings, we have to acknowledge that this side of being human is also present. And so we need to, we need to stand up, absolutely. But we need to do so in a way that doesn't cut anyone out of this human race. You and know. one of the ways to do that is to not I hear what you're saying. And I love it. It's not about focusing on what everybody else, because when we feel so angry, it's just like yeah. we're talking about the child. When you feel so angry, it's really much more easy to disconnect and get into our shoulds and yeah. pointing. And there's so yeah. much energy yeah. of that. Yeah. And what you're saying is by using the self-compassion, you're going more first inside, yeah. being aware of your own upsetness, and then this fierce protectiveness, yeah. what you need to protect. What is it that you're fighting for? So you're more yes. internally focused yeah. and protecting that and then bringing in and I, what you're saying with the refugees, protecting yeah. what you believe in and moving yeah. that into action That's right. rather than judgment is taking all your energy and being holier than thou and yes. I'm above. That's it's right. like I'm part of the problem. I have been. Yeah. I haven't been aware yeah. that, you know, just our own lack of awareness mm-hmm. and you have to hold that shame. And then I love what you're saying, like you get involved and mm. you I think what you're saying anyways, you bring that fierce awareness and self-protection of yourself right. out to the world of what you feel that you feel passionate about protecting. That's right. And so the driving force of compassion is desire to alleviate suffering, mm-hmm. which is kind of, you know, love is the flip side of that, right? right? You care about people and you don't want to see them suffer. And that's really the driving force. And that has a different energy than the driving force being these people are bad, we need to correct them or, you know, mm-hmm. that you need to punish them. That's, you know, because that is a motivational force, but I think it's not as sustainable or as effective in the long run. Oh, that you know, makes Because sense. the people who are, who are taking these policies on, dude, they're suffering too. You know, it's not like they aren't suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to so, work to get in touch with that. <laughs> I don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but... Wow. Yeah, they are, these are interesting times we're living in, that's for sure. The Dalai Lama actually said when he was asked about Trump, okay, I said it, the number one thing he said that we need is self-compassion right now. Isn't that amazing? Is that right? Yeah. He yeah. said that was the number one thing. The number one thing, because I think he knew, knows we need compassion, but because we're all suffering, we need to make sure that we're kind of filling up our own 
batteries or, you know, recharging ourselves first before we really go out and do the hard work we need to do. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And it takes a lot of hard work to not join and react. Yes. Um, You know, at times I think we all are very obviously being provoked into a reactive stance. And it's so easy to do that. And then you see much more chaos than with what you're saying is that if we go first into self-compassion and talking about the humanness of all of it and, and the, the awareness. Yeah. So interesting times we live in. (laughs) Very interesting times. And I'm really glad we got to talk about it. I really appreciate you coming. And before we sign off, Uh is there, if somebody wanted to go deeper in the study of self-compassion, would you, I know. So maybe before we sign off, there's one thing I would like to bring up that I like to talk about these days whenever I talk about self-compassion, which is the phenomena of backdraft. So when people start first start being kind to themselves, often what happens, what arises is kind of the opposite of kindness. We call it backdraft. It's a firefighting term, which is when there's a house that's on fire and you, you know, and take open the doors of the house, the air rushes in and the flames rush out because the fresh air kind of feeds the fire. So often when people start practicing self-compassion, you know, they've had a lifetime of their hearts being closed and, you know, the fire of suffering being being behind those closed doors. And so sometimes what happens when you start being kind to yourself, kind of the fresh air of acceptance and love rushes in and the old pain rushes out. And it can be a lot of, it can be scary and kind of disconcerting to some people. Either they think, I can't do this, I'm doing it wrong, or the practice doesn't work, or something's wrong with me. So just that people, that they know if that does happen, they start being kinder to themselves and a lot of like agitation or pain comes out, it doesn't mean they're doing it wrong. It actually kind of means they're doing it right. That they're letting this fresh air of acceptance in. And it's just the old pain rushing out and that it's temporary and that it will pass. Um, You know, also when we, we give ourselves unconditional love, we typically remember all the conditions under which we are unloved. That's very natural. That's the way the brain works. So just for people to be patient, if they try to be more self-compassionate with themselves, hopefully if the backdraft is strong, maybe get the help of the therapist or, you know, take a self-compassion course with a trained teacher to help through that through that difficulty. But just know that that's normal and natural and to be patient with the practice and to go at your own pace. Some people actually, we we talk about, it's like opening and closing a faucet. You know, you don't always want to have that faucet blast full open because you may get overwhelmed by letting in this new way of being with yourself. So just open it a little bit. If you feel overwhelmed, close it. You know, just go at your own pace. There's no rush to be the most self-compassionate person. And you certainly don't want to judge yourself for judging yourself. That would be hard. Yeah, but people do it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to recognize that the reason we judge ourselves and are so self-critical is we're just trying to stay safe. We're trying to protect our hearts. Very, very natural. We start opening our hearts. Pain rushes out. We feel scared. We feel incapable. Very, very natural. So in other words, as as people try to go down the road of self-compassion, they actually need to apply self-compassion every step of the way, which means being accepting with yourself. If it's hard at first, if you go slowly, I'm not overwhelming yourself. It's really just an orientation of gentleness and support as you actually start this radical new way of being. And there, there are a lot of resources. You know, my website, I try to make it a free website, a free resource. I have a lot of things on there. You can take courses, online courses. You can take a mindful self-compassion course. A lot of therapists these days are very aware of self-compassion. So, you know, I really believe that it's the best thing we can possibly do for ourselves and for others. I really agree. And I thought on your website, you also have a uh, self-compassion quiz to try yes. to help where you, you guide actually, on there. Yeah, you can take your own, just test your own levels. Just to test your own levels. Yeah. And you do some workshops that are on there. And I've, I've done a, a, a workshop and that's how I became aware. And yeah. I loved it. I felt like yeah. I, when I first went to, I was like, oh, I know all about self-compassion, uh, uh-huh. you know, but I was, I was really interested and I went and I learned so much yeah. because because on um, it seems like such a surface topic it's just being kind to yourself but yeah. it actually has so much complexity as you've it outlined does. here that yeah. to really stop and learn to do it and learn to do it for others
others. Yeah. And I love what you're saying there, too, that it can be, I hadn't thought about the bag drive, how hard, even when you mentioned the idea of if you start being loving and kind to yourself, um, the awareness of how much criticalness maybe mm-hmm. you've experienced in your life. Yeah, from yourself or others. You, absolutely. You know? And it comes up and naturally comes up. So just to, just to kind of be aware of that, and it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. The, the sad bit is when people get discouraged and they give up. I just can't. Actually, instead of people email me, thanks for giving me one more thing I'm bad at. And I'm like, oh, oh no. you kind of missed the point, you know. Well, can, yes, so, because I guess you start yeah. becoming aware of yourself critical. If you start to That's think, right. oh, maybe I need to do this, you mm-hmm. start paying attention to something about the self-critical and you can't just automatically stop something if you're in a habit of doing something we did a whole podcast on habit when you're in a habit it's so hard yeah so you got to be compassionate that it takes some time it may be slow it looks be slower for some people based on their history but movement is always possible i've not never met a single person who couldn't become to some degree more self-compassionate. Just to try to be way. a step by step. Yeah, that's right. But just step by step and, you know. When, like you said, you're an expert in it and you struggle yeah. with it. And when we recognize yeah. we have that negative self-talk, you yeah. can't just make it go away. No. It's also very culturally. We have, to, we have to own, we have to hold that in compassion as well. That how hard it is. Self-talk, yeah. How hard it sure. is to change that, to say, wow, yeah. it's really hard rather yeah. than, oh God, I'm so dumb. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You told such a beautiful story on your TED Talk about your uh. son. And when you did, mm. it was a time when it wasn't necessarily that you were beating yourself up, but you were so stressed. Yes. And I had such compassion when you were telling that story. Mm. But I thought the way that you handled it was so insightful. Would you mind telling that story? Yeah, well, yeah, I often talk about my son, Rowan, who who is autistic, because, you know, a lot of people feel they're afraid that self-compassion is kind of self-centered or self-focused, and they just, you know, think they should put all their energy on having compassion for others, especially parents. But I really found again and again that the more self-compassionate I could be about the fact that it was very hard dealing with an autistic child, I mean, especially when he was younger, he was pretty severe. You know, time and time again, I found that the more compassionate I could be with myself, the better parent I could be with Rowan. So, you know, sometimes he would just throw these horrific tantrums out of nowhere, out of the blue, just screaming and flailing. And he's about five years old. So people would look because they would say, you know, what's wrong with that kid? Right. What's wrong with that mother? That kid's too old to be tantruming he looks like that. Like it, yes. He looks like he should be normal. And what I would find is when, you know, when I had those natural reactions of getting stressed and agitated and irritated, his tantrums would ramp up, right? Because, you know, we, we have this, as human beings, we all kind of had this empathetic resonance. We pick up on the emotions of others. So when I got agitated at myself or with him, he would ramp up. But whenever I would remember it, actually, I put like 95% of my attention on myself. You know, this is so hard. I'm here for myself. I'd really soothe and comfort and support myself in whatever way I could think of. I'd actually really primarily focus on giving compassion for myself. I'd make sure my son was safe, but that was about it. What I'd find is, first of all, he would calm down. It was like mm. it was like a mirror. You know, the more I could calm and soothe and comfort myself, he would pick up on my mindset and become calmer himself. Right? It, it was like the neuro Wi Fi. But yeah, exactly, because mm-hmm. he was he was picking up on my calmer mind state. And then when I could really give myself what I needed that I had a lot more resources that I could give to him. I was much more flexible in how I could respond to him, the choices I made, what I was able to give with him. So I really found that self-compassion is actually what allowed me to sustain caring for Rowan. And I, I just don't know how I would have done it otherwise. I mean, I'm sure I would have survived, but it, you know, it would, I wouldn't have been nearly as effective it was, you know, I just saw continually what a powerful resource self-compassion was to help me deal with his autism. And yeah, it makes all the difference in the world. So oh, I can imagine you, you know, as you were yeah. talking and you, you did it for a second, you, uh-huh. when you were talking about self-compassion, you talk about putting your hand even on yeah. your own heart and your own yes. stomach yeah. and, and bring that warmth to yourself to say, yes. this is really hard. This is really and hard. being I'm a so mother. sorry. And yeah, this is... Everybody's yeah. looking at me and this... And he 
he's throwing yeah. a fit, and this is really painful, and that's hard. And yeah, but I'm here for you. And I would say that, you yeah. know, so I'd be alone in public with them, but I'm, but I'm here for me, you know. Uh-huh. So uh, that's such an amazing story. Yeah, and so. you mentioned as we were getting started that you guys are have a program. Yes, it's called the Horse Boy Foundation out in Elgin, Texas, so right outside of Austin. And we serve any families with autistic children for free. Um, It's nice because we back ride with the children, so the autistic children really like it, but it includes the whole family. So oftentimes there's that sister who hates the fact that her life is eaten up by her brother's autism. And this time, you know, the way she gets to actually ride horses is a way of working with the <sighs> with the brother's autism. So we, we really work with the whole family and uh, uh, really incredible results for the kids and the family. So if anyone's listening local to the Austin area, that's in Elgin, Texas. You can just do a Google search on Horse Boy Foundation. Do they need to be in Austin to come? or can Just they the be local area. Local yeah, area yeah, something. Yeah, and yeah. and there's a, a movie that you've made about yes, this. Yes, we made a movie about him. Actually, we've been split about five years, but we're still, we're still very much a functional family. Um, but it was called The Horse Boy, and we took our son to uh, Mongolia, and rode from shaman to shaman on horseback. It was a crazy idea. It wasn't my idea, but it worked, believe it or not. So, yeah, you can get that on Amazon Prime, I think, called The Horse Boy. You can see self-compassion in action. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, And as I mentioned before, as we prepare for our third season, we would actually really love your input. And we have another really easy and exciting way to do that. Go to www.therapistuncensored.com. And on our website there, you will see a button to very easily push and leave us a 90 second recording and give us your response. You can give us a response to to this episode or any input you would like to have in our upcoming season. If you have a topic you want us to cover, an area that you would like pursued, you know, we would love to hear from you. Any feedback, we'd love to receive that. And of course, be sure to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast player. Thanks, and I'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.